On February the 22nd this year, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, decreed there will be no war with Russia. Just two days later, Russia invaded Ukraine to the disbelief of most of the world. Sir Lawrence Friedman has followed the twists and turns of the war as the Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London and as one of the foremost experts in British strategic studies. Before this latest destruction of peace by Russia, Sir Lawrence was a member of the UK inquiry into the Iraq war from 2009 to 2016, and he was the official historian of the Falklands campaign. His latest book is Command, the politics of military operations from Korea to Ukraine. Thanks so much for making the time to join us today on the We Society, Lawrence. I think the most in question to ask is, will Ukraine win? Well, uh, I think there's a good chance of Ukraine winning now. On the um, on the day after the war started, uh, I, I came to the judgment that Russia couldn't win. And I decided it couldn't win because if it was going to get the full advantage of surprise, it had to take out the Ukrainian government and the U- uh, Ukrainian people, in a sense, had to appear docile and passive as a result, because otherwise it's an incredibly large country for uh, anybody to try to occupy. As the Russians had failed to do that, they were clearly going to be in with the struggle. But that's not the same as Russia losing. And I think through the summer, there was concern that this might settle into a, a long war of attrition. But I think what's happened since really July is the Ukrainians uh, helped a lot, it must be said, by um, um, systems coming in from um, their Western allies, have turned the tables, they've seized the initiative. Uh, And really, since September, uh, we've been able to see some quite dramatic shifts uh, so that even as uh, Vladimir Putin was declaring uh, that uh, 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 these four provinces were going to be part of Russia, he was losing chunks of them, uh, uh, and that has continued. So um, it's not inconceivable uh, that this uh, could slow down again, that Russia might uh, find some defensive lines. But at the moment, um, and I we probably should say that I'm, I'm talking in early October, uh, at the moment... Um, I, I would say that, that uh, things are looking reasonably good for the Ukrainians. There's always a caution. War, war's full of pitfalls and surprises and mistakes. Um, the Russians should never have got themselves in all sorts of ways in this position. So you've always got to be cautious uh, and not make firm predictions. But at the moment, uh, uh, the, the Russians look like they're losing. Is this a, a success for above any other President Biden in actually kind of getting, you know, bipartisan support at scale and getting munitions and military equipment into Ukraine quickly and training the, uh, helping to train the Ukrainian army. Would you, is, is that a kind of pivot, I mean, would you say? I think the Biden administration has played this pretty well. I think they, were, they haven't been uh, totally uh, gung-ho about it. They were very cautious to start with, not not about the uh, legality uh, or the strategic significance of, of what the Russians were up to, uh, but about what ways uh, they could help Ukraine and what the risks were. Uh, and this is true uh, uh, of their allies in a variety of degrees. I mean, the British were uh, up to the fore, the Germans a bit behind, but all of them have sort of come to the same position. I think the, the balancing act has been first, uh, what How can you help the Ukrainians without turning this war into something much worse, basically escalating to nuclear use in some way? Um, So they've accepted a degree of restraint in what they do themselves and to some extent the sort of kit that goes to the Ukrainians. And secondly, how do you introduce this kit in in a way that maximises the benefit to the Ukrainians? but doesn't again uh, add to the add to the risks, and that's not just a question of escalation. It's also a question of training, uh, of strategic value, um, of uh, how it fits in with the developing context of the war. So it's been quite incremental, and I think that's been important. It wasn't a sudden surge of material going to Ukraine. It's come in stages, 
um, and enable the Ukrainians to adjust to, uh, and adopt to it as it's come in. I think what's impressed people is just how quick learners the Ukrainians have been. I mean, if you think back to February when they were uh, sorting out Molotov cocktails for a sort of guerrilla defense of Kyiv, uh, and now they're, they're doing quite sophisticated maneuvers uh, uh, against uh, rather beleaguered Russian defenses. That's, that's quite a shift. Just a bit of a gear change, but um, uh, at this stage, I should say that this is the We Society podcast, and here you are, a strategic kind of expert, and we're plunged into this discussion of war. Um, but to what extent, as a social scientist and as a fellow of the Academy, I mean, do you kind of when I, we invited you onto this, the We Society p- podcast, do you think, what was your kind of thought? How does this, you know, We Society, how does that connect up with my world of strategy, military? Uh, what was your thought? What was your first reflection? <laughs> well, I mean, I started off uh, as a political scientist. Um, I've sort of become a hybrid historian, as many political scientists do, I guess, um, in the um, in the interim. I think social science is actually quite important to the understanding of war. Uh, and to take one very big example, in a sense, the sociology of armies. Uh, how do they hold together? What, how do you get people to go to a front line and fight? Uh, what happens if they don't want to make those sacrifices anymore? So uh, if you just look at at numbers and raw military power, you may not understand the social relations that make uh, a military work. Secondly, is the whole area of civil military relations, which is one of the theme of my book, which you kindly mentioned. Um, the One of the themes of the book is that autocracies often make very bad decisions on war. And they can make bold decisions, audacious decisions, because um, there's no checks and balances on on the leader. Uh, But that also means that there's sort of still small voice that says, is this really a good idea? Uh, Have you thought about that? Uh, How will they respond? Um, Can be missing. And this was, uh, this war was very much one um, that developed, germinated in in the mind of Putin, possibly when he was isolating uh, because of COVID. So I, I think the, a knowledge of, of how civil military relations work in different societies and different circumstances uh, has also been extremely important. So picking that point up, I mean, the kind of relationship between uh, social structures and capacity, uh, not only just to make war, but actually to get men and women on the front line willing to give their lives. I mean, it's a fairly obvious point. But, I mean, it's very vivid in this particular war, is it not? Yes, I think, again, one of the things that, that struck me from the start was what I call the asymmetry of motivation. It's not an original phrase. It comes from a, a good political scientist, in fact. But, but the, the point was that the Ukrainians had no choice. They were fighting for their homeland. And the more news came through of atrocities and war crimes and so on, the more determined they became, even though they've taken very heavy losses and seen their country pummeled and battered and so on in the process. The Russians weren't quite sure what they were fighting for. Um, And it didn't help that, that, that it was sort of an artificial construct of Ukraine that Putin had developed. So um, I think that asymmetry was extremely important. The other thing to note is that um, the longer a war goes on, the more economic and social factors can become important. You you fight the you fight at first with what you've got. If you haven't got enough, it all may be over even while you, you're you're just getting. Uh, people into uniform and, uh, uh, and uh, out into the field. But if it starts to last, uh, then issues of where you get your reserves from, how you generate extra uh, extra combat power, uh, bringing in support from outside, keeping your economy afloat, all of these issues become increasingly important. And it's notable, for example, that a key part of Putin's strategy has been to undermine support for Ukraine in the West, particularly Western Europe, by uh, undermining their economies, by by depriving them of energy, by 
depriving them of gas. So all these factors come into place. If you want a sort of an overview of how war is developing, it's not good enough just to look at the front lines and who's taken a kilometre here or a kilometre there. You've actually got to look at the underlying structures of the of the two sides and how well they're able to sustain a war over time. And again, I think without external support, Ukraine couldn't have done this. Uh, it would have been occupied because it just wouldn't have had the capacity to resist with external support. That makes all the difference, which means you then have to look at what, how has Zelensky achieved this? What he needed yes, to how do? How has Zelensky achieved well, it? He, I mean, he, it, it's a remarkable contrast, isn't it, between the, the Putin is a sort of um, uh, elderly, possibly ailing dictator, uh, isolating himself, talking to a few cronies. Uh, or ranting in his speeches in ways that, that look, leave his audience looking perplexed, even if they know they're supposed to applaud. And this sort of modern uh, performer, who's actually quite a shrewd businessman as well, uh, who understands modern media, his, his team is generally quite young. And I think what's been impressive about Zelensky, who wasn't getting particularly high marks as a peacetime president, is that he understood the performative nature of his role right from the start. And that famous line when the Americans were suggesting uh, that he might need to leave Kiev and go to Lviv or something like that, uh, you know, I, I don't need a ride, I need ammo, was a brilliant line. But also it's one he has sustained uh, con constantly. So if you want an example of... Um, modern political messaging, you know, look at his speeches to individual national uh, parliaments, each one sort of tailored to the history and traditions of the particular country. But, but you would say, presumably in your book, and you would say here in this podcast, that actually you know, the capacity of one man to turn it around is limited. I mean, the structures beneath, I mean, the military structure in Ukraine seems to be very effective. Uh, and also the kind of economic structures to kind of get, kind of to solve the, the logistic question and, and keep a fast moving army supported. I mean, it's been ex impressive. It has been impressive. I think the economic uh, structures are weak. I mean, I think they're holding because people accept it's a war and it's a priority. Uh, and I think there's a lot of concern about how well they're going to cope in the winter because, you know, the Russians have attacked a lot of their power supplies and so on. So I wouldn't overstate how good a shape they are in that, but they've done enough. It's been sufficient to keep the war effort moving. I think the military side is impressive, and, and, and that goes back uh, to a decision um, that uh, uh, Zelensky made in 2019 to change his chief of staff, and he's got somebody who understands, I think, contemporary military theory, understands the Russians. Um, but I think the, the key difference, and in, 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 again, it comes back to where sort of strategic studies and social science overlap, is that the the Russians, going and going back to the Soviet Union, have a very hierarchical system, very hierarchical command structure, whereas it's very difficult, indeed dangerous sometimes, for a junior officer to do something different to what he's been told to do uh, until he's got new orders. So he has to ask for new orders, um, and then he may be given permission. Whereas the, and increasingly the Western approach is what's called mission command, which is essentially you tell your junior officers what they're supposed to achieve, uh, and you then have to rely on them taking the initiatives to do it. So although the Ukrainian army also comes out of the Soviet army, and they both have the same uh, genealogy, if you like, um, the Ukrainian army has adapted uh, really since 2014 with British, Western, Canadian um, assistance and training and so on. So that it's understood that you have to take initiatives. And I think to some extent, the nature of the challenge meant that the Ukrainian force was distributed from the start, dispersed from the start. So they had no choice but to rely on people to take initiatives. But that's made a big difference um, because they're much more flexible and adaptable than the Russians have been. Just a quick break in the conversation to talk to you very briefly about the organisation behind the We Society. The Academy of Social Sciences is a national body for academics practitioners and learned societies in the social sciences. As the president of the academy, I can tell you that we championed the vital role social sciences play in education, in government, in business, the list goes on. 
From listening to the podcast, you'll hear that social scientists are at the forefront of tackling the most pressing issues of our time, from the cost of living crisis to the war in Ukraine. In every public or private sector strategy room in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff or Belfast, you'll find a social scientist. You can find out more about the Academy of Social Sciences' work, support us or read up on our fellows by going to the website acss.org.uk. That's acss.org.uk. You can follow us on Twitter at ACADSOCSciences and tell us what we should be covering, who we should be speaking to, by emailing wesociety at acss.org.uk. Now, back to the conversation. One of the burning issues at the moment is whether uh, the Russians will use battlefield nuclear weapons. But, I mean, presumably, if you've got... if. You're, <laughs> I mean, there's a demonstration effect. There's also trying to kind of kind of eliminate force on the ground. But if if your forces are widely dispersed, as Ukrainians are, you're, you know, you may make two square kilometers kind of unlivable. But you may not take out much Ukrainian military capacity. Exactly, and I think that's that's one of the problems with this whole debate is that, um, I mean, you know, it has, the Russian problem hasn't been a lack of firepower. They've they've been doing artillery barrages. Uh, from day one, and, and the, the, the Ukrainians have rather effectively taken out some of their ammunition dumps uh, and affected their logistics, so it's not like it was. But that, 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 that hasn't been their problem, a lack of firepower. And as you say, the difficulty with using tactical nukes is to get the best out of them, you need a pretty large concentration of enemy forces, and if possible, your own forces some distance away. And um, it's a very fluid battlefield at the moment where there's a lot of interaction going on between the two sets of forces. So it would actually be quite difficult to use uh, battlefield nuclear weapons. And, you know, also has to keep in mind that this stuff hasn't been used in war, uh, hasn't been tested properly for a long time. There hasn't been atmospheric nuclear tests since the early 60s. Um, so nobody's quite sure exactly what would happen um, if if you use these things, which is a, also a problem with a demonstration shot. I mean, they may act as, as advertised, they, they, they may not. So um, I think that there's a lot of reasons why um, the Russians would be very cautious before they go down this road. What would the West's response be? What should it be? What, what would it be? I think it's very difficult to say because there's a there's a there's a variety of ways in which you can use nucleus. You you, you can threaten cities. You can have a demonstration, and and the response would be, um, I think, proportion is not quite the right word, um, but it, it it would have to be tailored to some extent to what had happened. All that's been said is that it would be for the Russians catastrophic in some way. That's what, uh, and you know they have to assume it wouldn't be good, and when they're already in an extremely weak position, you also have to keep in mind that the Russians have used nuclear weapons, uh, as um, most strategists would say they can be used, which is for deterrent purposes. From day one, Putin has stressed that nuclear weapons are there to deter direct Western military involvement in the war or uh, direct threats on Russian territory. Uh, now, it's Which maybe, is congruent with their doctrine, of course. Yeah, right? congruent and, and, and with our doctrine to some extent as well. We understand that, and Biden has respected it very visibly. Um, By not giving any weapons that might well, so it's could be question, used on Russia, no, no intercontinental missiles. Well, certainly not intercontinental missiles, but not even very, very long-range artillery, which that they could provide. Um, but most importantly, things like refusing to offer a no-fly zone to the Ukrainians, refusing to get Western forces in a position where they might be fighting directly with Russian forces. Um, now, Putin knows that, um, and so one of the risks for him... As soon as you you use the weapons, all bets are off. Um, and so, does he? What does? Especially as Russia gets weaker in this war, isn't it actually quite important for him to maintain that deterrent effect, or does he want to blow it all um, in, in what would be a probably pretty catastrophic gamble, which would uh, transform? Um, international affairs forever in some ways would, uh, would possibly create fallout that, flow, that that goes over over Russia as well as everywhere else. I mean, 
seriously, is, is, this a, is this a good option? So one is left with the thought, well, this guy's crazy enough. He was crazy enough to, to launch a war. Maybe he's crazy enough to do that. And you can't say he isn't. But it's very hard then to sort of have rational um, policies in place to deal with what would be an irrational act. So all you can say is really don't do this. Um, however you do it, the effects will be very bad back at you. Even autocrats have to take some kind of yeah. cognizance of uh, public opinion. The problem autocrats have is, is they never quite know. Um, you know, they have suspicions about what people may be thinking. They may be doing some sort of private polling, which I think the Kremlin does. Um, but you're never quite sure. I've never heard that. So you think the, you think the Kremlin does I'm sure. I, I suspect they're, 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 they'll be testing. And there's also at least one uh, pretty decent Russian pollster st uh, still operating that, that, that's quite clever in, in, in finding stuff out. I mean, obviously... And do we know what this pollster says, this one? I mean, do yeah, you... well, the, the latest... I mean, we have to be careful because obviously yeah, yeah, the, yeah. people don't get very chatty in, in, the, <laughs> no. in, these, in these societies. So, But the latest poll suggests barely a few percent are in favour of using nuclear weapons against Ukraine and that since mobilisation, which was the big issue... Support for the war has dropped substantially. It was sort of passive, docile support at, you know, two-thirds of the population. It's now, you know, closer to a third. Um, and I think these are the sort of things that are going to worry Putin. I mean, there's, there's going to be no cheering, especially if you use nuclear weapons and it doesn't actually stop the war. And how? what's the end game then? If you think that Ukrainians could win, but the Russians not lose, what does that actually mean? My view has been that the most likely way in which it has to be brought to a close from the Russian side is the Russian military realise their position is untenable and they just can't take any more. Uh, you know, this is supposed to be, uh, you know, the second military power in the world, or maybe the third after the Chinese. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's going down the order pretty quickly at the moment. They've lost, what, five to six years of defence production, They've lost a good chunk of their officer corps. Some of the, their best regiments have been mauled. Uh, this is, uh, they've used up uh, lots of their stocks. You know, it's going to take them years to reconstitute from this. And the longer it goes on, the more difficult. Plus, there's, there's the reputational loss, which is now uh, quite severe. They'd be beaten by the Ukrainians in practice. Um, and they can blame NATO for giving the Ukrainians great weapons, but there's a, there's a lot of tactical and strategic skill that the Ukrainians have shown as well. So my view has been that the most likely, but it's not putting a percentage on it, is that the Russian high command say that this has got to be brought to a close. What, How Putin does this, whether it's Putin who does this, I don't know. I think the, the, the Kremlin... Decision making is pretty opaque. The, how the power structures are shifting in Moscow as a result of what's going on, the role of the technocrats in saying we can't, you know, um, if you want this uh, country to keep on going, uh, we need to get out of sanctions, all of those sorts of things. I don't know. Uh, but I think at some point the Russians accept that their position is untenable. Um, and then I think um, they ask for a ceasefire. And then I suspect the Ukrainians say, uh, you can have one uh, while you're withdrawing. And then there's lots of negotiations to be had. And, and maybe the Americans um, have to facilitate that because there are, there are many issues that no other mediator could manage. I mean, this isn't mediation. This is, um, you know, sorting out practicalities. Uh, so there are lots of issues. It's just as possible that nobody will be able to bring themselves to do it. And this thing will just carry on, um, although the Russians keep on getting pushed back. They'll hold on to bits and pieces of Ukraine and they'll see that as a basis for future operations. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, it'll it'll dribble on for a while. So that, that's why I, I'm cautious. But I find it very hard to see how the Russians can sustain this for that much longer. What's the timeline and immense importance to the global economy that actually, you know, this does come to an end with all the impact it's had on food supplies, gas supplies, the oil price. I mean, you know, everyone knows the story. Yeah. I mean, if this was to unwind over the next six months, you might get a very quick unwinding of all of that. And it would be very important for global growth and 
I, uh, I'd be surprised, you know, given what's happened in the last seven and a half months uh, and where we are now, I can't see this lasting that much longer um, as a full-scale war. I mean, I say, there's possibilities of it dribbling on. The issue of sanctions is a big one. Um, you think sanctions have been effective? Sanctions have been effective um, in one critical sense, which is that the Americans have prevented microchips getting into Russia and because they, it's a proprietary technology. And that has crippled Russian manufacturing, um, which uh, uh, so they haven't been able to replace a lot of the stuff they've lost and won't be able to revive really until they, th that can be changed. It's eaten away at, I mean, the ruble's high, but that's because um, there's uh, that they'll be earning money from uh, gas and oil, um, but nothing to buy with it. But they've also, uh, and this is the sort of the the bit where they've tried to put economic pressure on us. In some way, you know, in some ways you could argue they've hurt the West more than the West has hurt Russia. It's happening around Europe. They put enormous pressure on European economies but in the process they've lost their long-term markets um so eu is weaning itself away from um uh, russian oil and gas and this this is of enormous significance potentially um and they've also managed to you know, blow up the pipelines if they wish to resume it so that'll actually mean that the recovery will take longer uh the winter will be hard and the recovery will take longer whatever happens in the war i think we need to be realistic about that um but as you say, the sooner it's over, the better. And my, uh, I find, it, I think, if the Russians can't establish defensive lines that can take them through the winter, then it, you know we're 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 looking at, uh, you know, towards the end of the year, early next year, um, maybe sooner. I mean, these things happen very quickly. I I, I did one of the. Substacks I did was entitled, we took from a Hemingway line about going bankrupt. You know, how does it happen? It happens first, gradually, then suddenly. And that's what happens with military defeat. Lastly, here you are, you're one of our foremost kind of strategists or thinkers about kind of military strategy. What have you learnt? What have, as this entrenched, long held views? Have you adapted views? What are your, what's your kind of big conclusive thought about this? I haven't got conclusive thoughts yet. To be honest, I think it's fitted in with how I think about military power. It's extremely difficult to to use uh, efficiently. Um, the people have exaggerated uh, assessments of the problems it can help you solve, um, that it contains many uh, pitfalls and uncertainties, um, and that uh, it does depend on um, the economic and social structures behind it uh, as as much as the, the skill and professionalism with which it's used, though, though, though they are important. So I don't think I've been... I mean, what, what surprised people and what surprised me is not the, the way this war has unfolded, because it's like a number of military campaigns in the past have unfolded. It has lots of familiar a uh, aspects that, you know, Montgomery and Patton and Eisenhower would have understood perfectly well a lot of the time what's going on. It's the things that people were expecting to see which didn't happen. So the big cyber attacks. I mean, they tried, but they, they, they didn't work. Uh, what happened to Russian air power? What, what did happen to Russian air power? Well, the, the, first, the, the Ukrainians dispersed their aircraft. And secondly, that they used air defences pretty well. And third, the Russian air force was sort of lulled into complacency by the Syrian campaign, which had been quite easy um, because nobody was really shooting back at them and suddenly found themselves uh, with people shooting back and they lost aircraft early on and so on. But it's, been, it's still been extraordinary. I think one of the things you see from the Russian uh, military bloggers is sort of fury that the air force hasn't turned up enough. And when they do turn up, they still lose aircraft. So, the, I mean, it, it's the things that didn't happen that have been more surprising. But, you know, in terms of the operational aspects of this, um, it, it, it's not a surprise. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all comprehensible in terms of pretty traditional military concepts. 
just a, 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 a postscript. If this goes the way you think it goes, it's going to go. Is this going to set in train kind of the end of, you know, Russian military imperial ambitions and a kind of Russian conception of itself as an empire and a new kind of Russia emerge that is more of a kind of a nation state with recognizing the limitations of military power and actually maybe a rebirth of civil society. A note of optimism, just as a sort of final note? Um, I'd be cautious because, you know, the big opposition at the moment to Putin is nationalism, is nationalists. They're furious. This is their big chance and he's blown it. So that, that, that's the, the, the opposition. Secondly, you know, Russian, the aura of power surrounding Putin and the Russian state has been undermined. And that has potentially lots of knock-on effects. So it could lead to significant instability, some positive, um, but other in some areas quite negative as well. This is a big shock to the, to the Russian system. Um, and I think, you know, we'll just have to see. I think a lot depends on whether there, whether there is a succession and whether you have uh, a successor who is pragmatic enough to uh, so be a competent technocrat in helping Russia get, Russia get out of the mess it's now got in, um, or is still wishes to sort of promote this idea of the special Russian civilizational mission which Putin has promoted and which has led to, tr to trouble. So again, there are a variety of possibilities, but the idea that Russia is going to be the sort of Russia we hoped it would be in the 1990s uh, let's see. I, 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 I'd like to think it would happen. I think it's tragic. I mean, this thing, you know, the, the thing we should always say at the end of a war like this is it's tragic. What it, it, it's you've got two countries that have lost tens of thousands of people, um, and for a totally unnecessary purpose. The, the, of all, you know, you, you can understand why a lot of wars start, and the disputes at the heart of it and how difficult they are to resolve. There was no need to start this war. Nothing was going to be resolved uh, by a war of this sort. Sir Lawrence, thank you so much. My abiding impression of this is that uh, with every answer you've given, uh, the, there's so many possibilities, everything is contingent, and it's very interesting to hear a strategist and also a social scientist uh, kind of map a way through this and your kind of uh, your sense that actually kind of what's happening in a battlefield um, in which one force confronts another, what sits behind is as important or more important. Um, nonetheless, I think you've uh, kind of left us with a, a sense both of kind of optimism and a sense of tragedy. Optimism that actually um, the Ukrainians um, won't lose this war and some kind of settlement will emerge in which uh, they plainly kind of in some sense won and Russia in some sense lost. But the tragedy of tens of thousands of men, women, the barbarism, um, the unnecessary nature of it has all, also mm -hmm. been very sobering. So thank you very much. It's been well, an, an My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in the conversation. The We Society is brought to you by the Academy of Social Sciences, acss.org.uk. I'm Will Hutton. The producer is Emily Finch, and it's a Whistledown production. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast, leave a comment, share with your colleagues and friends, or send us an email and tell us what we should be asking and who we should talk to.